So for those of you who are brand new, I encourage you to go and check out Breaking In by Amina Horozik. It's a collection of interviews that she did with a bunch of business executives, design gurus, and they share their uncensored advice. The first topic that I wanna to talk about today is advice that Julie Hurd gave in her interview. And she answered the question, if an industrial design student comes up to you and asks, what should my portfolio be like? What do I need to show you in order to work with you? What would you tell them? Julie said, show the whole process, but in an efficient way. Research, concepts, refinement, final design. Carefully consider the graphic design slash layout of each of your projects and only show work you are proud of and can talk confidently about. There's a few different major points that she made in this and it's Boom, whole process in an efficient way. Two, boom, consider the graphic design layout for it. And then three, be able to confidently talk about it. This is going to make or break your success as an industrial designer. Ironically, you have to become a great graphic designer to be a great industrial designer. That's just part of the process. And so if you're feeling weak when it comes to graphic design, then you know you're gonna have to step up your game. She goes on and continues to say that we'll see students from the same school that'll be sharing the exact same project. If you were collaborating on a single project, there's likelihood that some of your other student colleagues uh, have, have submitted the same work to them. And so don't be like claiming you did it yourself because communicate what you did, your contribution, and then like be able to eloquently communicate your project and present it well. That's not something that's just gonna like hit you like a lightning bolt overnight and suddenly you can present your concept well just because you're passionate about it. It needs to be practiced. And if you haven't practiced it, um, I wouldn't leave the practice to when you're in interviews. Try and present it to the mirror, talk to a friend, practice with them. Do it guys, um, go through the motions and that's how you'll find success. Those who've been around the block a couple times, I'm gonna take an excerpt directly from Mike Mentiero's Design is a Job. On the topic of finding clients, he, he says, be pleasant, don't be nice. What does that mean? Let's find out. He said, we once received a call from a gentleman who said, so-and-so referred me to you. He said that you wouldn't be shy about telling me I was wrong. You'd probably piss me off and that I should listen to everything you said because it would work. Mike Montero says, I was delighted. That said, you should aim to be pleasant to work with as everyone would rather work with someone pleasant than with an asshole. But no one wants to work with someone who's faking it. Doing good work often requires a few hard conversations. And he says, there's a difference between being enjoyable to work with and being nice. No one's hiring you to be their friend. They're hiring you to design solutions to problems. But if they can get the same solutions from someone who's pleasant and someone who's a jerk, they'll go with the former. Not much that can be added on in, onto that, guys. I'll just simply say, um, be pleasant. Don't be nice. Uh, it's okay to say to a client, I think that that's not the right decision and here are the reasons why. In fact, I think they'll appreciate you more for it and respect you as a professional if you give them their honest opinion. But also be willing to make compromises and, and realize the reasons behind something. Are they just like a personal vendetta? Why am I making this decision I say this? Or is it really substantiated? And then you have to ask yourself, am I okay with moving forward if the client still goes a different direction. You gotta be professional about it. You can't throw a hissy fit if they say, you know what, I know you said this, but this is where we're going and I'm doing this decision instead. It's just part of the game. So there you have it guys. Stick around right after this commercial break. We'll be back and we'll be introducing today's guest speaker. So don't go anywhere. My name is Scott Henderson. I'm an industrial designer. I've been doing this for 25 years at least. Almost everything that I've ever done has been in the consumer products space, which means that it's a product that anyone can go out and buy. 
What I try to go for as an industrial designer is to design for the aspirations of people. If you look at the body of my work, you kind of see descriptors like warm and friendly, fun and lightness. Looking for a way to connect the product to them emotionally so that there's more there than a utilitarian solution. There's something there for them to see, to understand, and to get. And when they get it, when they get what I was trying to do, it puts a smile on their face. So in addition to this stuff being in Target or Walmart, I've had many, many products sold in the Museum of Modern Art's design shop. I think that my work transcends mass consumer products. And people can look at something that I've designed and they'll sort of stare at it and not really realize why they like it, what's coming out of there that's speaking to them. But there is something there, and I put it there, you know? That's why I think a design can live in, in different places, because good design has the same effect on people universally. Designers definitely need to be proactive in terms of spreading awareness of, of what design is and how it benefits humans and people. So that's why I want to be part of this, just to explain my little niche in product design and how I feel like I'm benefiting the greater human race by doing it. All right, everybody, welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. I'm excited to introduce today's guest speaker. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, share some love down in the comments as we introduce Reed Schlegel. Reed is a New York City-based industrial designer with a solid history working in the design consulting and education space. Currently, Reed's an associate design director at Aruladen and is an adjunct professor at the Parsons School of Design, where he teaches process drawing and digital visualization and Studio 4. In his spare time, Reed partners with brands and shares his design work on his Instagram account, which currently has 138,000 followers and counting. He creates online design curriculum and is designing and building a bespoke cabin in upstate New York. Reed, thanks for joining us here on The Variable. We're glad to have you here with us today, man. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. How, how's life? What's new and exciting going on with you these days, my friend? Uh, well, I mean, things are always busy. Parsons about to start pretty soon again. And, you know, working on our legions always keeps me on my toes. But working on the project upstate New York has been the, the main focus of my personal energy as of late. Yeah, like, tell us a little bit about it. I mean, you went as far as to specifically add this project to your bio. So you must wear it, like, with a badge of honor that you're making this cabin up in, in upstate New York. So, like, what start, what stemmed that whole thing? And, like, fill us in, fill in the gaps. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I've always wanted to have some type of spot in the woods. I never really thought I'd live in a city, but obviously we okay. did that at design school. I kind of realized the majority of the jobs are all focused in, in metropolitan areas. So okay. I ended up in New York and I've been there since 2012, which I love New York, but you know, everyone sure. needs to have a break and get away from the city once in a while. Yeah. And I had been looking for land for years, but COVID kind of kicked me in the butt to finally do it because things that were super cheap all of a sudden you couldn't even get anymore and everyone and their mother and their uncle and their cousin is buying land so i yeah. kind of had to jump in and just make it happen and you know everyone needs a side project to keep themselves going especially when things are more confusing out in the world as mm, we're all probably right. dealing with these days okay so i mean would you consider yourself an avid outdoorsman do you like to not only just do you hike? Are you rock climbing? Like, tell us a little bit more, like, about your interests. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think this year, I think I spent 38 nights camping, something like that. So okay. I definitely spent a lot of time outside. Sure. Uh, definitely do a lot of hiking. And I used to rock climb a lot more than I do now. Uh, okay. Living in New York City, it's a little bit expensive and hard to find a place that's not super crowded. But right. yeah, all those things are things I always like to do. And as I've gotten older, and especially through COVID, I'm rethinking what is... Um, a priority in my life. I've tried to add that back in as much as possible. Cool. Well, I think it's always fun to give folks a little bit of context about the guests that we're having on the show. So you've got this place that you're building. Where? What stage of building is the cabin in now? 
Like, is it almost so, done or do you just have planks on the ground? Like, <laughs> I wish it was almost done. Okay. Um, since I'm stubborn, I want to build the whole thing myself. And I've had a fleet of friends helping me with this. Um, sure. One of my really close friends from college, he is the architect who is actually working on this with me. So okay. we spent three weeks working on this a few weeks ago. And then I have my friend, Tim Gallagher, who's an industrial designer as well. And he's building all of the custom parts that I designed and he's bringing them up every other weekend and we're installing a few stairs and a few windows and door frame. Um, so right now it's, it's about a 17 foot diameter circle with two foot thick walls and it's about oh. three and a half feet tall. So it's gonna, it's gonna take a while right now. It's gonna be about yeah. 10 feet tall. So I'm hoping to get it done by December is the plan or at least. Okay. Tight. Okay. Wow. Well. Very cool. Interesting. Well, it kind of like this perfectly like segues into a topic that I'd love for you to elaborate on just a little bit for us, Reed. Um, side projects. I, I, I know mm -hmm. that's kind of like the debate. Well, there's a number of debates when it comes to being an industrial designer with side projects. So first thing I want you to address the, the talk to us about the value of it. First off, is it valuable? Should industrial designers have a plethora of side projects that they're continuously working on? Um, just, just weigh in on that and tell us what your thoughts are. I mean, I think they're invaluable. I think there's a certain okay. balance you need to hold with side projects where you can see it in so many different ways. I think it should be something that you use as a tool to scratch an itch that you're not getting at your current job, potentially. Okay. I remember when I was interviewing at Frog, um, the executive creative director at the time looked at all that work and he goes, well, you know, we're not going to be doing some of the things that we know you like. Are you okay with that? And basically I said, well, it's okay. I always have my side project. I can fill in the gaps. And after the interview, he told me that that was something that definitely worked in my favor. He was like, oh, I appreciate that, that you're open to what you're working on at work and you can have your creativity outside if you need to. So I think it's all about setting yourself up for as much success as possible. And side projects are a fun way to do that. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So in your particular circumstance, it, it played in your favor to be transparent and say, look, I've got plenty of side projects and things that I'm working on. And that helps me, you know, scratch the itch, essentially. Um, is there... Okay, because anything can be taken a little bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I know that we as creatives, we get zealous about the projects that we have, perhaps side projects and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe you can weigh in on this. I don't know from personal experience, but at least speculate a little bit too. How can, um, speaking from the other side, not industrial designers who have projects who are getting into jobs, but as probably a management team, like how can they have an in, a clear indication that this industrial designer is going to come in, they'll be dedicated during their working hours and get stuff done. And this side project that they're working on is going to scratch the itch, help them out in the long run, but not get in the way of the day to day work. Does that make sense? Is there any cue that, that we can sense. read and know, oh, they, they're balanced and they'll do it? Or is it going to consume them and they're going to drop at work? I don't know. I think if someone is judging someone based on what they do outside of work, that person might have some insecurities of their own they have to deal with. So oh, I wouldn't really okay. worry about that too much, uh, especially living in New York. I mean, for anyone who's listening right now who's in New York, you kind of know that if you're not doing a side project, people look at you like you're a little crazy. And I'm not saying that's a good okay. thing. It's probably great for a lot of people's mental health a lot of times, but sure. everyone has their job and their side hustle and their side side hustle. They're all, this is kind of a thing that a lot of New Yorkers just kind of do. And my, they might be the same other cities too, but I've lived in New York. I've lived outside New York my entire life and then in the city, my entire professional career. So I'm very biased to that one city. Um, but I think at the end of the day, your work speaks for itself. If all of a sudden your boss or your manager is telling you that your work is not meeting the standards they need, um, you probably need to balance whether you're putting enough time into work or if your side project is yeah. taking on too much. Because I mean, I'm the type of person that has a hard time saying no to projects, um, yeah. which is why I'm a director <laughs> at my company and a professor at Parsons and I'm building a cabin and then I'm doing curriculum on the side. So it's, you definitely need to be a person who doesn't like to sleep very much if you want to have too many projects, but okay. find that balance <laughs> is always important. All right. Well, I think you, you point out something that's important. That's like, uh, being able to gauge where you're at 
well, probably having all that on your plate at the same time takes its toll on your mental health, having all mm -hmm. that stress, yeah. the <laughs> lack of sleep. So, okay. So we talked about management, like, in, and I think that we kind of established that it's at least in New York, it's no big deal if you have a candidate who says, oh, I'm actively involved in all of these other side projects. It doesn't somehow put up a red flag like, oh, this guy's not going to be committed to the job and we shouldn't hire him. Um, now, for you, what talking about all those balls that you're juggling in the air, what's your strategy then to be like, OK, to know when you need to pull back on one or the other on the switchboard to make sure that everything's in focus? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely good to take a step back and look at your work once in a while and just be objective. Is, is the quality where it should be? And if, am I spreading myself too thin? So that's something yeah. that's definitely imperative if you're going to take off a lot of things. And I think it's also something that's probably a little easier the longer in your career you go, just because you should always be learning and improving, obviously. But, you know, sure. people kind of figure out the groove of how their job goes. And you can kind of gauge what your involvement is going to be week by week. And it's the type of thing where you just need to listen to yourself. Like I'm a big at, um, advocate for meditation. I do it every day and I've done it for about five years now. And I started because I got to the point where I was just so stressed out that I was kind of, my hands were shaking all the time. And oh, that's no. <laughs> why I realized like, oh, okay, I need to take a step back, remove some things off my plate. So now I definitely only take projects that I really find to be interesting and sure ones that I really want to do because, you know, if you do freelance work, which I do on the side as well, it's kind of, when you got a big check dangle in front of you, it's kind of hard to say no sometimes, but then you have to think, okay, is it worth me pulling my hair out over this for the next few weeks for an extra thousand bucks or two, or is it worth just having that extra hour at night to go to sleep early or read a book and, you know, be much more mellow and calm throughout mm. the week. Well, and then it's nice as you progress as a creative, as a designer, to be able to have the freedom to be able to turn down stuff as it comes up. You know, once you're kind of yeah. once you kind of got some money in the bank, uh, then like you can, you know, say mm -hmm. no. And that's fine. Um, cool. All right. Question for you then is. Should your side projects be in your portfolio should you showcase them yeah, i mean i can't tell you how many times i get asked that but i want you to weigh in on it for us reed i think it very much depends on the project i mean i think the the cardinal rule of portfolio building is making sure you're showing your whole process so if a portfolio is missing something and a side project fills that in then that's a really good reason to add it to your work but if it's something that's completely random or it's just a passion thing, I would include it, but put it towards the end because you always want to gauge the interview. I feel like people usually come in with too much content to share and you're, you're kind of rushed and speeding yourself through and that's not giving yourself any type of advantage. Yeah. So I would just put it as a small thing at the end. But at the same time, like I spoke to a student or one of my former studio students uh, the other night and they were trying to look at jobs and having some issues and just trying to talk through and say, well, look, I think maybe your side project right now should be going back and redoing a few projects. So it's, yeah. it's really looking at your work, reading the room. Are you having success with interviews? And if so, then you're probably fine. Maybe you don't need a side project or maybe the side project is actually the thing that's kind of putting you over the top. Um, Cause something else I would say is I've worked at only consulting firms. I worked at smart yes. frog and Arlene. And they definitely look for people who have interesting backstories. Um, okay. Like if you're someone who comes in and you're, if you have some crazy side thing, it's just, you know, designers expect everyone to be kind of interesting and have something to do. If you come in and you're like, I only eat tan food and I've never left my state, they're probably like, oh, that person seems a little boring. But if you yeah. say, oh, I love cooking and I traveled to Fiji last year or whatever it is, you know, people just like having a person that's got a, add some energy to the room when you're stuck together for weeks at a time on a project. So no, well, that's a good rant. thing to bring. Yeah. That's a really good thing to bring up because like, it, it's easy to kind of come across vanilla when you, when you're presenting your stuff, um, especially your projects, something to be considered to keep in mind. I know that Arizona state, we have our standard curriculum and any place that I interviewed at uh, post-graduation who has, interviewed a number of alumni all will look there. Oh, okay. And here's your power tool project. Oh, and here's this project and hope here's that. So adding a little spice 
to things um, certainly can can be helpful. But I think with all things, it, there's a balance. Uh, you don't want it to, like you said, it, it, maybe it's a thing at the end, just a, a more like an about me cool thing that I'm doing as opposed to a front and center project that you're showcasing. Yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, to each his own. I, I think yeah. that some firm might be like, oh man, this side project is what got you in the door and other ones, no. So it's hard to make a hard, fast rule and saying, yes, have a side project in it or <laughs> no. I think that uh, when it comes to graphic design and photography, because I get asked that a lot. Um, should I have my graphic design portfolio added to it? Should I have my photography added to it? I, in a number of cases, I think you should just utilize the opportunity to showcase those skills as you present the projects that are in your portfolio already. So if you've already got a housewares that you've designed, um, do some wicked photography shots of your model and do a fantastic layout. I don't know. This, this is where I'm coming from. If you disagree, I mean, weigh in on it and, and share your thoughts. But I think that's an easy way to um, kill two birds with one stone. Um, show yeah. your, your passion and interest without having it dominate and screw up your portfolio somehow. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I mean, I think that's the cardinal mistake I see in lots of student portfolios is here's my sketching section and here's my photography section. And I don't care if you can sketch well on its own or photograph things well on its own. I care about how you put all that together in your process. So it all has to be uh -huh. steps that help breadcrumb lead you down from beginning to end. And instead of just saying, here's this thing I'm good at, like you said, it's better if you can show here's this thing I'm good at and here's how it improves my work. And that's what you'll get if you hire me and if I'm working with you. So mm -hmm. I do think that's totally true. Um, because also, I mean, if I'm being frank, I think I've only seen maybe two or three portfolios that had a photography section where the photography section actually made me stop and say, wow, that's really nice work. Wow. Yeah. Most people think they're a good photographer. A lot of us are very <laughs> mediocre photographers. So I would just okay. make sure it's not just like cool photos of a building in your neighborhood or like your dog. It's, I would just do what you said, put it in the portfolio so that way they can see I can do this. And also I completely, like, I don't want to talk about photography, but different tangents connected is graphic design. Like yeah. when I teach my sketching class, I have um, one of my graphic design friends from the city come in and teach a whole class on specifically what they think about for type and using a grid properly because so many people's portfolios just feel chaotic. And it's yeah. true. It's like, you're just making more work for me as your manager if I have to take all your work and then completely format it and put it into something and I'm working on many projects at the same time. So I don't have time to do that. So if you can come in and show me that at least to a base level, you can get things looking pretty nice. It's just one extra little check mark on your resume that makes mm -hmm. me want you because I know that A, they have amazing design aesthetics. They can do all the hard skills, but then if you can pull it all together and have some nice photos and a nice graphic design layout, it's just gonna make everyone else's lives easier. And that is something that people don't talk about, but that's ultimately what I'm hiring you for is to make my and the rest of my team's lives easier and our clients happier. Like those are the two things that like at the end of the day, we're really solving for. On top ding, of ding, awesome ding, man. Yes, yep. exactly. Oh, and that's a, mm, I want to like stress that point home <laughs> that your job is to make everybody's life easier. So when somebody's looking at your work, students who are tuning in, if they're looking at your work. Can they look at your presentation and be like, oh man, they're going to really help us out because Joe Schmo over here, he does great stuff with 3D and whatever, but anytime he tries to put a presentation together for our clients, it's like we all kind of shake our heads and we have to rework it so it's up to snuff. Um, you want to make lives easier, not complicate totally. the process. Okay, so Reed, I want you to tell us, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, we've gotten into portfolio side projects. Um, I want you to take a step back and give us as many variables as possible, as many takeaways from your experience in the field. So question that I ask a lot on the show, and I think it's perfectly applicable in your case as well. We wanna have you walk us through, not necessarily like tell us your background of how you got into design, but walk us through the different places that you worked and through the lens of telling us, this is what I learned from this experience working here. This was my major takeaway there. This was my takeaway there and here. Like, give us a little bit of a, you'll walk us through your history, but 
in the scope of here's my advice from what I learned at each of the places. Cool. Yeah. So I guess I'll bundle internships into one spot because I interned at a place called HS Design when I was in college. And they're, uh, they do mostly medical design and they're out in Gladstone, PPAC, New Jersey. A uh, few people I worked with are still there. So if they're listening, hello, everyone. Uh, oh, and then the second place I worked at no longer exists. It's called Quirky. And if for anyone who, I guess, in their late 20s or 30s probably knows what it is, but it was a company that came around in the beginning of the Kickstarter era and people could submit ideas and then the community would vote on a live stream every Thursday. And then the design team would take the most um, prominent ideas and then give them some love and try and get them to a place where it could go to manufacture. And if it did, then the person who submitted it got a royalty. So that place is really okay. fun. Um, but those two places, I think the thing I learned about those were neither of them were the perfect fit for me. I learned a ton from both experiences and I really used those to help shape where I really wanted to go. I learned from my first internship at HS that I loved consulting, but I learned that maybe medical design wasn't specifically for me. Um, that's something I've actually kind of changed my tune on over the years. There are really cool oh. companies like Surgical coming up and there's a bunch of my friends have gone like Google actually has a big medical presence now. And those two companies are doing really cool stuff. And there's probably a whole bunch of other ones of us I've been aware of. Um, but at the time, it helped me at least narrow down where I wanted to go. And then Quirky was the opposite. Um, and actually, sorry, one last thing I'll say is the only reason I wasn't super into medical at the time was because of the timelines. Some things I worked on then didn't come out till five years later. And as a student, you know, you're itching, mm. you get some stuff out, you want to see instant results. So yes. that's why I think I've changed my tune because I've realized that's just par for the course. Takes time. I think yeah. sometimes take a while and <laughs> you can't ask for them to happen overnight. But Quirky was the opposite where things literally did happen overnight. And it was a startup and it was a, there was a lot of us there. It was like maybe 200 people working there or maybe 150. Um, so my long story short is even if the internship isn't exactly what you want, like your fate, like it's not your number one choice, always okay. take it, in my opinion, because you need to have at least two points on a graph to learn anything from it. So like, oh. it'll either tell you that this is what I really want, or almost as equally as important, it tells you what you don't want. And then you can kind of feel like where you want to sit in the middle there. I know as a student, it feels like an internship is a huge commitment. But in reality, it's three to six months of your life, which is nothing. I, I nothing. Think three, six months feels like it was two days in, at this yes. point in time, especially during yes. COVID where time is kind of irrelevant. But that's a different <laughs> right. topic. <laughs> right. It's its own um, rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's just something I always talk to students about is making sure that you always take something, even if it's not perfect, and then really looking back on the experience and thinking through what was positive, what was negative, and how it can shape where you want to go. Because getting a job is not just them hiring you. It's also you wanting to work at that place. So yeah. I think it's something that people always get so frantic about jobs that they don't really sit back and think through those types of things, which I wish I had done more of when I was coming out of school. But I know that was a lot. Um, I can no, that's going. great. Dude, yeah. keep keep riffing. So okay. internships. Yeah. <laughs> so internships, so then, I agree. Just take them. If I'm recapping yeah. what you said, just take them. Like you said, two points on a graph. You learned a lot from that. That helped you gauge the direction you're going. I knew that from my early experiences in design, I opened up to fields that I wasn't even considering. Same medical. Um, I had a little bit more of a positive experience with medical only because I don't think I was uh, expecting to see, you know, I was just happy at first to just have a job. <laughs> and so I didn't expect to see anything come out, but I've been pleasantly surprised at some of the medical work that I've um, worked mm -hmm. on in the past has, has come to fruition, but I, this isn't about me. Get back to what you were saying. So that was your internships and those are your yeah, major sure. takeaways. Moving on from that, uh, what's your, yeah, your advice to your guess. younger self? So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so my first full-time job was at Smart Design and that started as an internship, which went to full-time. Okay. And yeah, I think going there, it was my first I mean, honestly, I learned so much working there. Um, I mean, just in general, uh, smart design is a place that I find really does take risks on young students. And I could never express how appreciative I was of that, of giving me a job, like looking into now being the person who hires junior designers and interns, it's so much of a, it's so much of a leap to kind of trust that person's going to give you what you need. And the fact they did that for me is something that I'll always be thankful for. Yeah. But working there, I'm trying to think what would be the best thing. I guess if I'm going off of the internship thing was um, when I was there, I had an internship that turned a three month internship turned into two months of freelance and then a month of freelance. And then I actually was offered a job at Stanley Black and Decker. 
And I was really interested in going there. It just required me to move to Connecticut, which I didn't know anybody there. So the location wasn't the part that I was super thrilled about, but the job itself seemed super interesting. They were doing cool things. I love tools. Obviously, I use them every weekend when I'm building up state. Um, but what I learned from that was sometimes you kind of have to be your own advocate where it was probably the scariest thing I ever had to do at the time. But I went to my manager and said, look, I've been here for almost a year. You guys know I would do anything to stay here, but I've been offered a full-time job and I need to take that job. That way I can have a salary and insurance. I can move out of my parents' house and get an apartment. Yeah. And it's basically, I, I kind of, I'm probably giving it a much more blunt version than I actually did in real life. But my recollection was, you know, I really want to be here, but if I can't turn this into a full-time job by Monday, I won't be here anymore next week. So I kind of laid it all on the line and at, literally at the last, at six Put the ball in Friday, court. they sat me down and said, all right, we'll give you a job. And it scared the crap out of me. But I think it's just something that people need to learn. It's, it's way too easy to just kind of let things coast and wait for things to happen for you. And I think sometimes okay. you just got to go all in on it and just make stuff happen. Like you, you get, what's this? You take zero, you make zero percent of shots you don't take. I think I'm not a yeah. sports person, but I guess you get zero opportunities you don't ask for. Like you kind of have okay. to advocate for yourself sometimes to make shit happen. Yes. So that was uh, what I took from SMART. Yeah. Um, but then Frog, SMART is a much more traditional idea that I was doing where true phone modeling, uh, lots of sketching, lots of CAD, doing lots of things for OXO. So it felt like a very good transition from school. But then going to Frog, it was much more of a large scale strategy place. So we were doing lots of ID work. But we also were doing blue sky projects, research projects. Um, and I think the lesson I got there was just seeing how much wider the industrial design world is outside of just sexy sketches and model making. There it was, we did. That's I a rabbit hole we could go down. The government for sure. one project. We worked, you know, like, you can go, I guess, this seeing how much bigger it was. And that was something that I really appreciated because that helped me build a much larger vocabulary for design and being able to okay. lightly speak strategist and speak engineer even better and then speak marketing. And those are the types of things that help you progress in your career. So the reason I'm bringing that up was in that job, I really learned how much being a good public speaker is going to help you in your career and just being confident wow. in speaking. If you can't speak on a dime about anything, it's gonna be trickier for you, especially when you're in front of people who are very powerful and have lots of questions at big companies. Sure. You always have to have an answer. And that was something that I got good at. Obviously you don't wanna like, fill it with bullshit. You wanna say yeah. things that are true and that yeah. are actually helpful. <laughs> but it just, throwing yourself in the deep end of speaking, I think is something that everyone should do because it's, you can be a great designer, but if you can't speak about your work, it's going to be hard for you to kind of progress up the ladder and get to where you need to go. Yeah. Oh, that's great. But then and... I guess as it finishes out. Go ahead. Sorry, I guess I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm, I'm thinking through the question as you asked it to me, because I'm trying to think, wow, what are the things I learned from these places? But our lead and where I currently am, the reason, or one of the reasons I went there was to be able to work with the beauty lifestyle team and the tech innovation team. So I think just okay. working at Arlene, I learned so much about aesthetics and just really compelling storytelling, not just, okay, how do we make this work? And then, which I learned a lot of at Smart Design, like really engineering things and making it beautiful and figuring it out. And then Frog was, what's the bigger picture around this product? And how do we think about this on a much more strategic level? And then Arlene was like, okay, this what attracts people to something? Why is someone interested in this? What is a beautiful object? And then mm. how do I express that through mood boards and photography and really, really good graphic design? So our lead definitely has a really high standard of aesthetics and just making sure you are on point with what's on trend right now. Mm. So that was something that I wanted to go there to learn and it pushed me. It was a little bit out of my comfort zone. I thought I was okay. gonna be an engineer before I found ID. So, right. oh, coming I think a into lot of us that, did that and working with really talented people has been something I've really appreciated. So that's it. That's what I got. I'll shut up now for a second. Oh, uh, no, no. Hopefully you're, you're fine. I think that's great. And I, you, you have a well articulated uh, flow of, of what you've taken away from every single experience. And I think that's great. And, and one of the main things that we want to push to our, our listeners and our audience is that there's your core that you're going to get 
core education that you'll get in university and in school and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's the stuff that you take away, your secondary skills that you take away from actually getting into it and doing work. And, and you can't substitute that experience, the the everything else of design that it, it's a big, it's a package. And, and we can't expect universities to cover everything in school. They give you the foundation yeah. to build on, but it's a false um, understanding or false premise to say that if I do well in school and that's it, then I'll be set moving on. There's a steep learning curve as soon as you get into that first gig and you talk about a number of those things that you need to master, you know, presenting well, um, speaking confidently, uh, the, the list goes on and on. But uh, thank you for, for telling us your story, but through the scope of the, the lessons that you've learned. So, read. We've covered the past. Let's talk a little bit about the future. So you've talked about what you've been gained from where you're at right now. I just would like to hear, tell us like, where do you see yourself in another five years? What's the vision? And like, how are you gonna do it? How are you gonna get there and, and take it up another level? Maybe you don't know yet. It's always a good question. <laughs> I, feel like, I think I'm currently thinking that through these days where okay. I think all of us in the pandemic had a lot of time to really sit down and think what are your priorities and what are things that you really want to be doing. Okay. Um, I think in five years from now, I'm not saying anytime soon, I would, I know my personality and I like to dive very deep on things. That's yes. why I got good at sketching because I dove into it for several years. And like my secret sauce usually is I just have intense patience for like, like very mundane things like drawing a building made of stone for three days or laying a building made of stone for three months and just doing something that takes a lot of patience and attention to detail. So I would definitely love to work for a single client and just really, really get good at something and just not have to always sell yourself so much, but more of just, they know you're the expert because you have dove so deep on this topic and then just learn everything about it. I love following rabbit holes. And I think doing that for a certain company or industry or product would definitely be something I would like to see through. But I don't know who that is, when that is, what that is, just something I've been considering. Um, so we shall see where that all pans out. But also, I still want to keep teaching. I love teaching. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's good. We're getting a number of comments from people on, on YouTube saying that the audio is out um, here on Zoom. It seems like we're doing good. Um, as far as is it, we're both out or just me? I don't know. Uh, it says that the, the sound is gone on here. So hopefully, I don't know. As far as uh, troubleshooting, I can see I all the audio. So it could just be an issue with that. Um, thanks for pointing that out, guys. I mean, there's only so much that you can do to try and troubleshoot and avoid issues when it comes to audio. <laughs> but uh, uh, we just got confirmation that we can hear back on YouTube. So um, let's get back to it, Reed. Sorry, I mean, things happen. Everybody says, oh, John Smalls, Ryan Smith says we can hear on YouTube. Better to be sure than, have <laughs> than to just keep going on and have nobody know. Okay. All right. I want to know. Thanks for sharing. So pulling back around. Thanks for sharing, um, uh, you, you know, dreams, ambitions and stuff. Um, I got a little bit distracted there. Why don't you recap in, in a quick punch for us then, Reed. So where was the future of Reach Lay goal in the next five years then? I think as in a nutshell, uh, I would love to dive deep on a single area, much more okay. than reinventing it every few months. I think after going on 10 years in the consulting field, uh, you learn so much and it forces you to be an avid learner and speak many languages, wear many hats. Sure. But if I'm talking about five years from now, I'll probably be married with a kid by then, probably have a mortgage. And I would love to have something where I'm focusing on one thing and just getting really, really deep on it. That way Ooh. it's not surface level figuring things out. It's all the way down through whatever organization it is. And that could still be consulting. It could be in-house, could be myself. Okay. It's I was just going to say, but I was going to ask that because you were on 
um another podcast oh i just blanked it this morning i was i listened to it minor details that's it mm -hmm. uh you were on that podcast and you have a whole episode dedicated to in-house consult uh, versus in-house versus consultancy and yeah. you guys kind of touched on that and, and debated you know um you've done a lot of consultancy work as have i um and have yet to do something in-house and in that episode you didn't specifically say okay i'm uh, I will or won't go that direction. It's still still up in the air. So it seems like even since yeah. then, you haven't settled on whether you would go in-house and focus on one specific thing. It has its pros and cons. You specifically talked about getting burnt out in that episode from doing consultancy work and the 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 circle, <laughs> the circular up and down of, oh, now we're crazy yeah. busy. Now we're slowed again. Now we're crazy busy. Um, you still chugging along real good or yeah. um, or, or are you kind of like ready to move well, on? I don't know. I think, I think no matter what your job is, most of the world's feeling a little burnt out these days. So I try and take that with a grain of salt with any project I'm doing, whether it's work or personal projects, even my personal projects, sometimes I'm like, Oh my God, this is too much. Why did I take this on? This is so much to do, but no, I think something probably since that podcast too, I've learned to take with a grain of salt is just, it's the nature of consulting. And you can fight it and be frustrated by it all the time and drive yourself nuts, or you can embrace it and then realize that certain decisions are out of your control and some are, and just focus on the ones you actually can have positive change on. And if you do that, it'll give you a much longer shelf life as a consultant. And honestly, consulting is a lot of fun. So as long as you can make sure you don't hit that burnout, it's something I definitely recommend to people, especially people in, earlier in their career who want to learn a ton really fast but you will need to know that it's a lot of work. It's a lot, a lot of work. Hours. You do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I enjoy it. Um, but it's not for everyone. It's kind of like business ownership. Is it like for everyone? I mean, mm -hmm. can we say that it's great? Uh, it, it has its benefits and it has its challenges. Okay. Before we head off to our Q and a segment, I want to wrap things up for, for, for everybody read. Um, can you please tell us what is your variable? What's that thing, your secret sauce that has come time and time, come through time and time again to serve you well and has helped you become the designer that you are today? Well, I think I said it before a little bit, but honestly, just having very very high levels of patience and diving deep on things is something that's helped me. And it's something that helped me kind of in a roundabout way where you and I had discussed before this about Instagram and things and going in there and having the patience to sketch every single night, having the patience to do really in-depth marker renderings that at the time, no one, or not no one, but many people weren't really doing anymore. Right. That kind of helped me build my audience online, which was something that helped me get noticed at uh, frog it helps me get my job at parsons it gives me freelance oh. gigs um, sponsorships and things uh, it's the type of thing that having that patience and putting it into something tangible was something people could obviously see and then that just had a lot of dividends which i couldn't have even have guessed in the beginning and it's something that also helps with teaching as well you need to have patience when you're working with students you also have that for consulting. You'd be patient with clients because they're basically mm. adult students that are paying you. So it's just a different way of looking at it. <laughs> so I really that think that you. that is the secret sauce is just having a lot of patience and design and using that to dive really deep on things when you find it's something you're passionate about or you think it's really worth your time. Ah, uh, that's great advice. Okay, uh, I now that you mentioned it, you did talk about your following on Instagram, how that has helped you in the long run in a number of different job opportunities and so forth. Um, now that you're on this side of the experience, I mean, your channel still continue to grow and um, you're obviously still working on that. But if you were tomorrow starting all over again and, you, and you're talking to the new um, students who are striving to get noticed in the industry and so forth, would you recommend them going that same route and saying, okay, 
just start cranking away and build a, a Instagram following? Or is there some other tools for building notoriety and exposure that may or may not get more bang for their buck that you would push them in a different yeah. direction instead? I think I would tell people to hold off on Instagram or the social media up front. Okay. I know that it's a pretty strong itch for people that want to get right into it. But the reality is... Instagram is going to put your work in front of whoever it chooses to put it in front of. So you might get lucky and use the harsh use your work, or you might just have a bunch of your grandma's friends looking at your work. You have no idea. And when you're a student, I think I, when I started doing it, it felt like a safe place because there wasn't a lot of people looking at ID. It was sure. like Spencer Fugent was on there and maybe Scott Robertson and um, Seng Wong Suk, I believe was his name, and like the ski Ren books. Um, yeah. So I wanted them to see my work, but it felt like it was a place where I was going to practice and it, it kept me going. Okay. Every day okay. I want to post a sketch and it was more of a practice type situation. Um, but if you are doing something where you're improving your skills, people might see that and they don't know that you're trying to improve your skills. They just might see that you have not great skills in rendering and they don't understand mm. that you're getting better and you're using it as a thing to improve yourself. So honestly, at this point, since there are so many eyes on social media and people's platforms, I would hold off until you have enough content that is really good that's going to speak strongly for you, even if you're not there to speak about it. Because uh -huh. if you don't, it's just putting your name next to work that you know is maybe not great because you're a student and you're learning and you're improving, opposed to, and then I see that and I, I was like, I watch the best that you can do. And you might have something else, which is really good. So I would really just encourage you to do more things like we did detox, we call them detox sessions when I was in school. I don't know where that name came from, but we okay. all meet up as a group once a week and someone would teach a skill or we, so I did a screen printing workshop one time and I did one on oh, um, Adobe InDesign and then my friend did one on Rhino and someone did it on the phone shop. So I think practicing in safe spaces where you can learn from each other and you're not being judged by uh, the trolls on the internet is probably mm. better. And then once you get to a place where you're proud of your work and you really think it's good to share, you by then probably have a big backlog of work. Because also the other part of Instagram is once you get that ball rolling, it feels like you have to keep it moving, which can be super stressful. And it's oh. not probably the best for a lot of people's mental health. So I would say it's better to practice your work, get it really good, build a big catalog of work. That way you have enough to consistently post for a while to get that traction. So that way you don't have as much pressure to be cranking it out every single day because on top of a job or school, it can feel kind of daunting and honestly take the fun out of it. Oh, that's its own rabbit hole that we could go down. And uh, that's a really good takeaway right there and some advice because, I mean, I don't think a number of us even consider the implications of posting work that's in progress or, or that you're a skill that you're building on. You just think I'll just put it out there. But um, people judge it and they see it. And that's a good lesson right there too. When you're presenting stuff, yeah. you're judged by the worst thing on the page often. So no pressure, true. but try and make it. <laughs> That's just how, how yeah. it all works. Okay, guys. So, so no one take away, keep practicing. Definitely don't take away. Oh yeah. Sit and practice. And if oh, you yeah. want to put it online, you can. Um, I would just, just keep also in mind that people don't read your comments, like what you the description under there. So if it's, even if it says, this is a new skill I'm learning. I'm so excited to be progressing in this. I'm probably just going through and I'm like, ah, oh, it's a mediocre thing. That's yeah. nice. And I'm sorry yeah. to be so blunt, but it's kind of how social media works. No one has attention yeah. span these days. So just knowing that and understanding what you're putting out there is probably advantageous for everyone, especially if you're earlier in your career. Okay. Great advice. All righty. Well, here, let me get this center screen. Stick around, everybody. After this brief commercial break, we're going to open up the lines and have Q&A here with Reach Lego. So don't go anywhere.
All right, everybody, welcome back. So we have some questions that were submitted to us before we started today. Um, we have one that just came in the chat that we're going to open up the line for. Hey, Pranav, thanks for joining us on the variable. Here, let's unmute you real quick and go ahead and ask Reed your question. Hey, Reed. Hey. Yeah, so uh, my question to you is, um, so being a student at college, like, you know, what are the certain things that we can take advantage of versus being in the industry? Well, so. I think the easiest thing is a lot of people, I know it's difficult right now, but it might be opening up, is the facilities at your school. Uh, when you leave school and you want to do a side project, you all of a sudden miss not having a laser cutter or a shop or oh, a metal, yeah. whatever it is, all the things that you just don't have. All of a sudden you have to buy it or pay for a membership and that stinks. So I definitely think doing, taking as much advantage of what's there. Also tapping your teachers for more than what they teach. It was something that I did when I was in school. I really wanted to, I did a lot of fine art before I got to school, which is how my sketching was already at a pretty good place before I even started design school. Yeah. But I did fine art. So it was very slow, lots of finger and wrist movements, not like, you know, full body movements like you would be taught in a sketching class for ID. And I was super self-conscious about being very slow at my sketching because, you know, it's not about making the work of art. It's about cranking as many ideas as possible. So I went to one of my professors, Larry Fensky, and I asked him if we could do an independent study because he was really good at beautiful, fast sketching. So I worked with him once a week, every day for a semester, or every once a week for a whole semester. And he basically taught me how to up my speed, how to reduce quality on some things. And then by the end of the semester, I could crank out 10 times as many ideas at equal or slightly less quality, but you know, still really good. And yeah. if I hadn't asked, him for that i never would have gotten that out of school so basically don't just take the classes that they force you to take also figure out what you can tap into whether it's facilities or your fellow students like the detox sessions or your faculty because a lot of them probably have some really cool stuff that you can learn from if you just ask them for some time mm, i like that okay we have some more that just came in uh abe camacho Hey, given that you're teaching as an adjunct professor, um, he's a professional. And he says, what advice do you give to a professional who is thinking of teaching design to students? Like run or get into it? <laughs> I think, A, it probably depends on what they teach it. But you're breaking up. You say that one more time. Through... Oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, no. yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. I already said it now like I did something to change it. But, um, okay, so I would think through, hey, what are you teaching? But the biggest thing overall is just making sure that you have patience. That's a big one because you don't want to ever, okay. you want to give students advice, but you don't want to make them feel bad because you want them to continue to progress and learn throughout their education. But the biggest thing that you can do to make that clear is really make sure that you've done your homework to have a point of view on something. You're gonna get asked questions that you've probably never had to rationalize before, which A, I think is why teaching is good for everyone because yeah. students ask you questions that make you think, and then you solidify your design process, which you can then bring back to work. So it kind of works for every, it's a big cycle of everyone's actually improving all at the same time. But mm. just having patience, making sure you're pushing people without crushing their souls, and then also just making sure that you come in with a strong point of view. So that way you can be a clear guide and you don't want to be wishy-washy to students because they're already probably thinking a lot of things that <laughs> are very ambiguous and all over the place. So if you can give them clear answers as much as possible, I think they'll appreciate it. Ooh, that's some good advice. Okay. We have another question that he sent in as well that I think would be great for you to address. We're talking about... Good from junior ID position to senior ID, what is the biggest distinction or difference that separates those two different classes of designers? Yeah, I think well, both positions are ICs or individual contributors for projects. Not that creative directors aren't contributing as well. It's a different type of contribution. It's not like doing renderings and sketching as much. But when you're a junior designer, you're much more taking advice from people and clear direction and executing it. Whereas when you're a senior, you're also doing that. But at the same time, you're expected to be leading projects a little bit more. It's not make okay. this rendering, rendering looks great, put it in the presentation. It's what should this rendering be? 
what are we trying to explain here? Does this storyboard make sense in the whole like flow or architecture of the presentation? Um, as a senior designer, I expect you to be owning a little bit more of filling in the presentation. I'll probably come in as the director on the project and make the skeleton and the framework and say, here's the tone, what we're gonna say, here's what we need at a high level. But the senior designer is the person who's really the boots on the ground, who's leading the rest of the junior designers to make sure that you get those assets put in place and fill in that story in a way that makes it compelling and beautiful for when you actually give it to your client in the presentation. That's great. So it's just a little yeah. more leadership basically. Yeah, yeah, that, make, that makes sense. And, and a well thought out answer, appreciate that. So. Taylor Chandler has submitted a question for us. He asked, what are some ways we as industrial designers can be more effective at what we do? What is something you see that is lacking in students and young professionals? The simplest one is I don't think many universities have caught up with teaching CAD and rendering to a level that people actually need. Um, oh. I know this sounds probably sacrilegious for me to say, because I got notoriety for marker rendering, but you don't need to go into marker rendering as much as Instagram will probably tell you. Uh, okay. To caveat, I said it the entire time I put it online. I do it because I find it fun, not because I'm trying to tell the world that's what you need as a skill. Uh, if you really want the skill that's going to get you a job faster is can you do complex modeling in a way that you can then put in key shot and do beautiful renderings? Because everyone jumps in so fast and most schools that I know of don't teach those things at all, or they're teaching software that I don't think is relevant, or you're just not getting enough. So there are so many awesome resources online. Will Gibbons, Sam Gwilt, they have awesome stuff online. They come in our guest lectures for my class at Parsons because they're way better than me at Keyshot. I can teach the basics at Keyshot and get you to have nice renderings that are completely acceptable, but they're the ones that are going to come in and blow your socks off with renderings yeah. that just are super sexy and looks super, super real, which I can do, but the time for me to do it is not worth it a lot of times. Whereas some of the junior staff I work with are just light years ahead of what I ever thought you could do with Keyshot. And they're the ones coming out of school. So they're who you're competing with. So I would say those two things, the number two, if you really want to spend time on the weekends is get amazing at SolidWorks or Rhino, but I'd probably say SolidWorks is the first one and then get really good at Keyshot. And then sketching is another thing we should always talk about. It's never going away, but it's mostly as like quick sketches. How can you communicate your ideas? Not like sit down and do a full blown rendering. That doesn't really happen very much anymore unless yeah. you're doing it digital. But that depends on the place. Some places still do a ton of digital renderings. Our lead we barely ever do that type of thing, but it's just different from place to place. Okay. Um, so as a follow up to that, then his next question he sent that's really good is, what's a good way to get into so you you're you can weigh in on this as a consultant working at consultancies what's a good way to get into consultancies is it more about having good connections in order to get your foot in the door or is there more specific is there something specific that is searched for in a portfolio slash resume or interview well connections make the world go around so that's always yes. going to be helpful uh yeah. if you ever have a connection obviously don't be overbearing or weird about it but if you have any connection to place always feel always try and reach out uh, something that people don't think about is there's referral bonuses that people get if they bring in a new hire so sometimes people on the other side actually have a lot of um in vetted interests vested interest in getting you a job there as well um and also the thing is like i said making everyone else's lives easier if there is an open position that makes Things there is a void and that means everyone else is working harder to fill that void so there's an active need to fill that so people aren't just being like oh we'll fill it at some point it's like no we need to get this so we can all keep our head above water so if you reach out and you know that person and you feel very strong about your work just be professional about it and keep it brief and then it might pan into something honestly so connections are always great but other than that honestly the thing i always look for are the three things i just mentioned it's basically can you think really broadly with either sketching or model making or cad whatever you choose or all three mm -hmm. ideally yeah. if you can throw your weeds all together um, and then having at least a good foundation of rationalizing your ideas. So however you choose to do that, I don't think you have to go insanely in depth on research, at least not for all of your projects, maybe just for one in your portfolio. Um, and then just backing it up with really good concepts. I would say it's always funny how a lot of portfolio projects go from like, here's all my sketching and here's the final idea. When I make my students at Parsons um, have their studio class, 
I structure it just like a real project would go at the office. Basically, my whole class oh, is called how to be a, so, so you want to be a consultant is my class. And Ooh. they I give them a brief that's modeled just it's modeled right after the Arlene one. So it's very similar to what you see in real life. And it's broken down into phases. And after the first phase, you have to present three ideas, all rendered, all figured out to a believable level. And then you take one idea and then you go down to like the Will Gibbon style, like Sam Will sexy renderings, telling the whole story, showing all the details. And at each of those phases, they have to present their work to a design studio. Like last year, I think our leading was the mid-phase presentation and Frog was the final presentation. So that way you're, you know, if your work is good, they've already seen it. You've gotten that connection just from taking that class. So in a nutshell, you know, tell your process and then have the imagery and the CAD to back it up because just how people kind of jump into it and do what they call sketch cat these days. Mm, good advice. So All right. Sense. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, Reed Schlegel, thanks for joining us on The Variable. We want to take this last moment while you're all on the air to put our plug out there. If you haven't, please take a moment to subscribe and share the channel with your friends. Um, if you're trying to find success in the industry or you know other industrial designers um, who could benefit from great advice, uncensored advice from stellar guys like Reach Legal here, um, please give us a shout out. We appreciate it. Okay, um, just, uh, just to final wrap things up, we'll say yes, thank you. And um, we're gonna end the stream. The, one of the benefits of logging into Zoom is occasionally our guests are gracious enough to stick around as we unmute the mics and, and they'll talk with them. Reed, you're welcome to stick around. I know that you're, you've got a busy schedule, but um, we'll just simply close our broadcast here by saying again, thank you so much for coming on The Variable. We wish you continued success in your career and we'll be eagerly watching you on your social media channels okay man awesome thank all you right. so much Stay, like no said, problem great all right you guys have a good one we'll see you around see you, everyone